we are back. This is episode number 71 of Calibrated with Scott. I'm Scott, of course. Before we jump into it, if you guys wouldn't mind liking this video, subscribing if you have not, if you wouldn't mind also going and following me on Telegram and Twitter, those are the two places you can stay constantly updated. And you can also support me on Patreon. All of those links will be in the description. But without further ado, let's get into it because we have a ton to talk about today. Uh, and I wanted to start with the uh, counteroffensive or what is left of it, I guess. Uh, we haven't seen any movement on the front in weeks, basically. Uh, I mean, outside of, you know, a hundred meters here or there, literally almost no movement. Um, I'm actually in the position right now, uh, in my analysis where I'm going to say that the counteroffensive has failed, uh, and it is basically wrapped up. Uh, we are looking at a now defensive Ukraine, a Russia that has the initiative in Ukraine, and, you know, there's this talk that the counteroffensive is going to continue into the winter, uh, but that's just not realistic. That's not really how war works. Uh, you have to build up your uh, fighting capability. Uh, you need to stage and then you need to go on the offensive. And then after you go on the offensive, you slow down, you come back on the defensive, you rotate, you refit, uh, you rebuild these brigades that were lost or damaged and have lost their combat capability, and then you come back and you do it again. Um, if you look at any war, like World War II, uh, you know, the Battle of Kursk, if you will, the Germans uh, took a good long while to build up their reserves. They actually waited a quite a long time for uh, new armor to arrive in uh, their, you know, in terms of their larger tanks, the Tiger tank, and I think Panthers as well. Uh, they waited quite a long time and actually delayed the onset of the Kursk offensive uh, for those pieces of armor because they thought that they needed them and they might have definitely needed them. Um, so, you know, you can't just continuously go on the offensive and continue taking high losses. At a certain point, you have to slow down, uh, you know, establish where you are and then uh, refit, rebuild and then go again. And uh, the Ukrainians are talking about not doing that, I but it already looks like they are doing that to me. So I think that that is nonsense. It's just a way to delay this sort of bad news that the, uh, the counteroffensive has failed. And, you know, we're looking at now 125 days, I think, uh, 124 days, something like that, into the Ukrainian counteroffensive. And I'm going to post up some pictures here of the Bakhmut salient. Uh, the uh, Vermisky Ledge and the uh, Robotino uh, salient as well. <clears throat> and if you look at these, you can see the distance that has actually been penetrated into these uh, defensive areas, uh, you know, into Russian territory. Uh, and it's not significant. There, there's not one place on the map where the Ukrainians have pushed more than 10 kilometers in. And I was being very generous with my measuring here. And the maps are from deep states. So these are pro-Ukrainian maps. These are not, uh, you know, Russian maps. These are these are pro-Ukrainian mapping. So what they're saying is being very generous to the Ukrainians. Uh, you can see around uh, Verbove on a, the deep state map that they give them a lot of gray area that's not really in gr the gray area. It's actually under Russian control. Uh, and they also haven't updated their map uh, for the recent Russian uh, reversal of progress in these areas, which I will uh, throw up here. You can see the Russians have actually pushed the Ukrainians back over that first line of defense in some areas uh, around uh, Verbove. And uh, to the south of uh, Robitny, uh, you can see that the Russians have also made a little bit of progress, uh, which is not significant. It's not, you know, uh, it's just a small counterattack in these areas. But the cost that these areas came at for the Ukrainians was immense, especially around uh, Verbove, where we actually had another road of death. Um, and I'll put that up here. Uh, I think that there are 42 individual pieces of armor in this uh, picture, uh, vehicles and armor, I guess. I think most of it is armor. Uh, and that is substantial loss. That is a whole uh, assault battalion uh, worth of armor just gone. Right. So th this is a this is a big deal. Um, this these losses are not minuscule. Uh, we've also had rumors that the 47th uh, Mechanized Brigade has been rotated out because they have lost their ability to perform combat operations, which means that they have suffered extreme losses and heavy attrition. Uh, I've been having a lot of conversations about how, uh, you know, how many losses the Ukrainians had in this conflict. Um, and we really don't have a specific number. 
I definitely believe that number is uh, 50,000 plus in terms of total uh, KIA and wounded in action. Uh, and I think the upper limit would probably be around a hundred thousand, but you know, I, I, I don't have any specific, uh, information on that. Only what I can anecdotally pick up from, uh, you know, statements from people who are on the ground talking about the losses in their units, uh, from day to day or in totality. Uh, but those are here and there, and they're also anecdotal, right? Uh, you can't really copy paste one person's, uh, experience, uh, onto every single battalion, company, brigade, whatever it is, in the counteroffensive, and then pull some random number from there and just assume that's what it is. Uh, so when it comes to losses, I think that the Ukrainians' uh, losses in terms of their actual combat capability has been severely degraded. Uh, one thing in particular that has severely degraded these uh, fighting capabilities is the Russian uh, deep strike capabilities. Um, and this is where I, I wanted to kind of move, I wanted to move into this and really make this sort of a, a primary focus of this uh, podcast, because, uh, you know, I've talked about the counteroffensive a lot, even last podcast, I had said it is basically a failure, nothing's really happening. Uh, but now I'm, I'm calling it a failure, because the, uh, you know, the Russians are now have, uh, you know, have the initiative. And the Ukrainians are now on the back foot, they're on the back foot around uh, Seversk around uh, Liman, uh, up in the north around Kupiansk, and then even on the southern direction where the Ukrainians are supposed to be on the offensive, they are uh, dealing with a Russian uh, form of, I guess, aggression, I would say. Um, it's not necessarily like a, an offensive. They're just sort of trying to reposition better within some of these salients where the Ukrainians have pushed in, and they are doing so. So the Russians have the initiative. Uh, there's rumors of a Dnieper crossing uh, by the Ukrainians. I don't see how that would ever be successful, uh, especially because the Ukrainian counteroffensive that would be the distraction for said landing has stalled and is not performing uh, anywhere near where it was supposed to. So any sort of crossing, I feel like, will be easily focused down by the Russian forces in this area. They still have the ability to rotate in reserves. I'll put a uh, uh, ISW quote up here where they talked about uh, revising one of their previous statements where they said the Russians weren't actually able to rotate reserves because they were either out or they just needed them elsewhere, which would, I guess, also mean out. But uh, and then ISW came out and said, well, basically, we're retracting that because, you know, a VDV uh, unit and uh another, I think the 42nd had been moved in to this area. So we're revising that because the Russians can actually do that, which is kind of funny that, oh, you know, now the Russians can do things, right? Oh, now, now they're they're capable. Once we've admitted that this offensive is failing, now the Russians are able to do this stuff. It's, it's just goofy. And uh, it's what you kind of come to expect from uh, these Western uh, think tanks uh, that are pushing a narrative instead of actually pushing facts and uh, reality. Um, but they can't because that would be the end. So back to what I was saying, what I want to talk about in this podcast is what I would consider the tipping point. Uh, so the Ukrainians have for this entire conflict since, you know, the line sort of stabilized after uh, the Kiev withdrawal, uh, the, the the Ukrainians have been in this fight. They have had a, a substantial fighting force. They have been able to defend against the Russians and even attack and go on the offensive in some areas. I believe that that is now done. Um, I, I'm not saying that the Ukrainians will never be able to go on another offensive again. Uh, they could, uh, if especially if their army is completely rebuilt. Uh, I'm also going to get into that in a little bit. But for right now, the Ukrainians are now on the, you know, have their foot off the gas. They're, uh, the Russians are now putting their foot on the gas. And there's a lot of contributing factors to why I believe we've reached the tipping point where Ukraine will probably never be able to get back to the position that they're at right now. Uh, one would be the failure of this counteroffensive. And it's more than just a combat failure. It is a geopolitical failure uh, for Ukraine. Uh, and this is affecting multiple aspects of uh, 
you know, their relations with Western countries. Uh, you're starting to see articles, uh, and I'll put some up here, of, uh, you know, Canada and Britain and, you know, the Poles saying that they don't have weapons to send to Ukraine anymore. Uh, and this is significant because this is sort of seems like a uh, choreographed uh, press release. Uh, all these countries are now coming out and saying, oh, well, we're dry on artillery uh, guns and ammunition, except what we need to defend ourselves, which, you know, could be an attempt to increase defense budget spending uh, in these countries. But I honestly doubt it because it, it, it just puts off this incredible weakness that none of these countries really ever want to promote uh, for themselves. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, basically, Britain is saying we're out of weapons to send. We can't, we don't have the surplus. And that means that if they get into a extended pr protracted conflict somewhere for whatever reason, not saying they will, but if they were to do that right now, they would not have the ability to sustain their own fighting force. They have what they need for defense likely, but an actual uh, operation somewhere, I, I, you know, I don't think that they now have the capabilities to do that in any significant way. Uh, this does not include the U S I do believe that the U S still has uh, very decent stockpiles. Uh, wh whether they're willing to send that to Ukraine at this time, I'm not 100% sure, but, uh, you know, time will tell on that. Uh, it also affects, uh, you know, the way the West is going to now think about giving aid to Ukraine. Uh, we've seen the Speaker of the House uh, get removed um, after a failure uh by uh, the Republican Speaker of the House to uh, actually promote what the Republican Party wanted, uh, and he was then removed. Uh, he uh, extended the government shutdown, and uh, that is just not what the Re Republicans wanted uh, right now. So uh, McCarthy is out of the Speaker of the House uh, position, and, uh, you know, the the deal was that the Ukraine aid would not be attached to a separate bill because when it's attached to a separate bill, it might get voted on without actually uh, being, you know, they're not necessarily voting for the Ukraine aid. They could be voting for another part of the bill. That's how a lot of these bills get passed. You know, things are just kind of added in and that's, there's a, there's a debates that go on and, you know, Republicans add stuff. Uh, everybody adds stuff to the budgets and then eventually it gets passed when deals are struck and, you know, it, it, it levels out both ways. Um, so they're not allowed to do that anymore. And Biden is com now coming out and asking for a hundred million or a hundred billion dollars rather for Ukraine over the next year. So 2024, and that would basically cover Ukraine's fiscal needs for 2024. Will it actually cover their fiscal needs? I'm not exactly sure. I would have to crack the books. I think that the Ukrainians are doing something like 24 billion. Uh, I think every three months is their requirement is $24 billion. I could, that time could be wrong, but that would make sense coming out to a hundred billion, you know, four extra billion on there for whoever. But uh, yeah, so that is now what the, the Biden administration is trying to, uh, uh, you know, bring to Congress is this a uh, hundred billion dollar uh, aid both financial and military aid for Ukraine for the for the year of 2024. And that will lead into 2025, where then it will be voted on. And if anybody knows what is happening in 2024, it is an election year, right? So the, you know, the Biden administration really wants to get this uh, spending uh, bill passed, uh, this support bill for Ukraine. And that would mean that Biden wouldn't have to deal with constant uh, Republican, uh, you know, discrediting, I guess uh, that's not the word. Uh, the Republican party will come after him viciously every single time he asks for billions of dollars for Ukraine. If it, think about if Biden in the middle of his election cycle, you know, he just got, he just is about to do a debate and he has to go up and ask for $24 billion for Ukraine. How is that going to look to the American people who are about to go to the vote, you know, about to go to the booths to vote? Uh, it's not going to look good, especially because, you know, you have infrastructure issues here. You have, you know, Maui got destroyed, all of this different stuff. We, the U.S. has problems that need to be solved. 
And that money going to Ukraine is just a bad look, right? Whatever you think about the necessary that are the necessity of defending Ukraine, you know, whatever, however you think about that, the, the, the optics on it are just not good, right? When you have kids here that aren't getting meals, right? You have one in what, four Americans have to skip meals, something like that, because they can't afford, uh, you know, every meal every day. Uh, people go to bed hungry in the United States. So when people are going to bed hungry, they're going to vote a particular way. And, you know, they're not going to vote for the people wanting to send mil uh, billions of dollars to Ukraine. And uh, this idea, you know, sending this money to Ukraine is a bipartisan idea. This is not a the Republicans are almighty and the Democrats are, you know, sending all this money abroad. No, it's the warmongers in both parties want this to continue. They're making a bunch of money from the military industrial complex, but they will use whatever they need to use to get into power. And then once they're in power, they'll just continue sending money, right? So 2024 could line up to be a very difficult year for Ukraine on the back of this counteroffensive if this $100 billion isn't passed and Biden has to go through his election year constantly bringing up money for Ukraine. So that, that that's one aspect of the counteroffensive failing. The other aspect is the belief that this money is going to go in the right direction is iffy, right? You know, you, you just gave a whole army to Ukraine. You just trained, what, 60,000 men, uh, maybe. That's probably the upper end uh, estimation of how many people were trained by the NATO countries. But let's just say 60,000 men uh, for these multiple brigades that went on this counteroffensive did nothing. Are you, is that a good investment for you in the future? If you're looking at this and you don't really know anything about Ukraine or Russia, you're just a politician. Is this a good investment? Is this going to get you votes in the future? All of these things you have to start thinking about. And, you know, on the back of this failed counteroffensive, that trust, that, you know, idea of Ukrainian victory, about the Ukrainian project working out, about a Russian defeat even if it's just a strategic Russian defeat, is slowly starting to slip away, right? And another aspect of this is how much the Russians have improved, right? We're talking about the Russian uh, reconnaissance, the ISR capabilities, uh, which uh, helps with target acquisition, intelligence, uh, uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Uh, ISR, uh, mostly in the form of drones uh, or satellite imaging, um, has improved tremendously for the Russians. Over the past month, two months maybe, I have seen more uh, deep reconnaissance drones, uh, you know, 70, 80, 90 kilometers behind uh, Ukrainian lines, uh, lining up and uh, lighting up targets for Tornado S, Iskander, uh, you know, all the different deep strike weapon systems that the Russians have are now being actually used appropriately because after a year and a half of conflict, the Russian military is now a, a much more well-oiled machine. I made a tweet about this where I said that the Russian army that went in in 2022 was rusty. And before anybody jumps to conclusions, I don't mean rusty as in like their shit is rusty. I mean, rusty as in they haven't had a combined arms conflict in the entire the entirety of the Russian Federation since the collapse of the Soviet Union, right? They had Georgia, which was a small incursion into the northern part of the country. They had, uh, well, it, it was an incursion into the country, but Georgia is so small and they were able to deal with it with overwhelming force. Uh, Crimea was incredibly easy and quick and Grozny was just an urban battle in a city. So, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of carryover from those into Ukraine other than the Battle of Mariupol, perhaps Severodonetsk and Bakhmut, which are the major battles of this conflict. But in terms of the totality of the war, it doesn't help with deep strike capabilities. You know, it doesn't help with all this stuff. You're fighting uh, adversaries that do not have uh, proper air defense networks. They do not have uh, Western intelligence being fed to them. Uh, none of that exists, right? And Crimea was just a cakewalk. They went in, they secured what they needed to secure, and then it ended. And so 
the, the, these capabilities specifically, I think, are the most important. The losses for the Ukrainians in the rear have increased substantially. Also, add on to that, the the coordination between the ISR capabilities and uh, Russian glide bombs now. We see, uh, you know, 30 to probably 50 glide bombs landing a day now across the front. Those numbers are incre have increased from 12 to 15 maybe a day. And soon we are going to see probably close to 100. And that's when the attrition is really going to start setting in for the Ukrainians. The Russians are using FAB 250s, FAB 500s, and FAB 1500s, which are progressively bigger bombs. Uh, they had some issues with the guidance kit on the FAB 1500, but that has been uh, fixed and now it is actively in service. And I expect to see many, many more uh, FAB 1500s, which are devastating. They do a devastating amount of damage, right? So that's one capability. Uh, we also have the FPV drones for the short uh, range defense. FPV drones, in my view, have replaced Landsat in most cases because they are cheaper and they honestly work just as good, if not better, than a Landsat. A Landsat is uh, difficult to fly in and hit a target. Uh, it's a straight line. It's hard to hit a moving target. It's hard to hit where you want it to hit. You can hover an FPV and just lightly sit it down on whatever. You can fly it through a window. You can put it in a tunnel. You can do whatever you want with it. You can pinpoint strike uh, infantry, right? So this weapon system in, in short range is much more applicable than the Lancet. The Lancet has now been uh, regulated to longer range missions, which is actually very decent for it. But we've seen a lot less Lancet strikes because they're just not as necessary. An RPG uh, attached to a drone is going to do more damage to a tank, probably, than a uh, Lancet. And that's just because, uh, you know, they're just better at it. You know, the, the, the explosive capabilities, you know, against the tank is maybe not the best uh, example, but against light armored vehicles, uh, you know, uh, anything that's would be considered an AP, APC or IFV um, are very easily destroyed with these drones. Tanks are also destroyed with these drones, but they have a better chance of living. They're probably equal to a Lancet in that regard. Um so that has increased significantly. We've also seen domestic Garand II production increase uh, dr dramatically. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen constant Garand II strikes, uh, uh, primarily in Odessa, but uh, you know, in Dnipropetrovsk, in uh, Krivorog, um, all of these different places have seen uh, constant, constant uh, both ballistic and drone strikes. So that is also increasing, um, you know, the Russians are at a place now where their military industrial complex is online. Whatever they want to do now, they can just turn in that direction, focus on it for a little bit. And, you know, they're going to be producing more uh, tanks, you know, IFVs, uh, whatever they need, artillery systems. Like I said, Tornado S has made a huge comeback where we haven't seen it in a very, very long time. I don't know if they were destroyed or if they were just being held back because they weren't super effective without the ISR capabilities that the Russians now have. But this weapon system is the HIMARS equivalent, but better in my opinion. Uh, the shrapnel spread on this is much, much more significant. And uh, we've seen it do uh, pretty good damage over the past couple of weeks. Um, and really, this is what I mean by the tipping point. Can you can you kind of understand how everything I'm saying is lining up? The Ukrainian counteroffensive has failed. Russian defense has succeeded dramatically, where they have not been sustaining high losses like the Ukrainians have for the past three months. The Russians are now poised to go in multiple different directions and apply pressure all over the map, where the Ukrainians probably won't be able to adequately defend every area. You know, all you're looking for is one breakthrough, one breakthrough that forces a bunch of rotation and then multiple breakthroughs happen. And I think that's how the Russians are going to go about this. I, I, I don't think you're going to see a large Russian offensive anytime soon. No big arrows, nothing like that. They're going to continue to attrit the Ukrainians through 2024, maybe into 2025, I don't know if the Ukrainians can last that long. I would say by the third quarter of 2024, I think the Ukrainians are going to be hurting pretty bad. And that's considering they have the full backing of the United States and its allies as well. So if that drops, we could see 
uh, much a much quicker wrap to this. Uh, you know, we could see the West pressure Zelensky into negotiations. There's there's a whole number, a whole litany of things that could occur. Uh, but if the battles continue the way that they're continuing, and judging, uh, you know, my analysis of what the Russians are planning to do is to take it slow, continue attriting the Ukrainian army who is becoming less and less effective on the battlefield. They have less and less artillery pieces, less and less ammo to fire less and less tanks to distribute, you know, everything. Even armored vehicles seem to be almost non-existent now. All we see now is, uh, you know, a complete lack of IFVs around most of the battlefield and a majority uh, being civilian vehicles, trucks, cars, you know, the lot. So it, it just feels like the idea of any sort of Ukrainian victory or any sort of massive uh, degradation of the Russian military is just slipping, right? And uh, I think that the Russians are going to take advantage of that. I think that they are not going to pursue negotiations in any meaningful way. Uh, I don't think that they are interested in restarting the grain deal, uh, which has been very clear through their drone strikes. They've been hitting uh, Rennie and... Uh, it's like Ismail, uh, Ismail, or I don't, I don't know how to pronounce it. I've never actually heard it pronounced uh, in uh, southern Ukraine, uh, where grain has been transported into Romania over uh, land, and we see daily strikes on all of the infrastructure trying to transport grain into Ukraine. Uh, this is uh, something that I think is significant for the conflict because no grain leaving Ukraine means that the situation in Europe in terms of food inflation is going to increase dramatically. Add on to that a cut in production by Russia and uh, Saudi Arabia and OPEC plus uh, production cuts are going to start hitting uh, soon. Uh, we are going to see a steep increase in prices over the winter for Europe. Will this be the breaking point for Europe? I don't know. It depends on how the Russians go about dealing with uh the infrastructure, the energy infrastructure in Ukraine, um, if they go after that, it's going to become increasingly hard to get grain out of the country. Uh, and there's going to be a, a big onus on protecting that and fixing that. And, you know, as this grain becomes less and less moving into Europe, that that inflation is going to go up. And if there's a rough winter as well, uh, with those increased energy prices, that's when you're going to start feeling the crunch. That's when these degraded European economies are going to start taking a significant hit. Uh, Germany's already in a recession. Britain's looking to be in a recession if they're not already in a recession. And it's just going to progressively get worse and worse. And all you need is that first, you know, it's like Jenga. You keep knocking pieces off. The Russians just keep knocking pieces off of the of the European economies. They, they, you know, they're, they're starting to struggle. And then once you take that one out, the whole tower collapses. So I think that's that's currently the Russian plan. And, uh, you know, I don't know how they're going to deal with this. You know, U.S. oil production has not increased. Uh, the U.S. is now sitting at 17 days, I think 16 now, of uh, strategic uh, petroleum reserves, which is incredibly low. It's the lowest it's ever been in history since it, the, it was created. And that is horrible horrifying because if the U.S. gets into any situation where, uh, you know, oil uh, is is cut off for any reason, the U.S. is going to be in a desperate situation. And once again, the Biden administration has kept this strategic petroleum uh, reserves uh, open and flowing into the economy uh, to uh, feed Europe and to feed uh, and to maintain prices here in the United States. And that is all uh, in the bid to get reelected. So what I what how I see it is that the Biden administration is actually sacrificing national security for, uh, uh, you know, reduced prices and the to keep this illusion of uh, prosperity going. Uh, but still, you know, we're sitting at three to four dollars per gallon in most places. So it's still what I would consider unacceptable for how much uh, domestic oil production we could have. Um, but yeah, that's where I, I think that's where I want to wrap it up for, uh, Ukraine. Uh, I wanted to actually touch on the situation in Israel. Uh, th this is a very complex issue. 
I don't have a strong opinion about it one way or the other. I'm going to lay out my opinions for you guys here. Uh, whether you care to listen to this or not is up to you. I am no expert on the Middle East. I try my best, uh, but I have no direct connection to the culture, uh, the language, anything like that. So all I'm doing is looking at this from a Western perspective. You know, when it comes to Russia and Ukraine, I have a, a better idea of the culture, the history, uh, you know, what has happened in these countries, how this has gotten to this point, especially over the last 10 years. I've been watching this very closely. Uh, but in terms of Israel and Palestine, I have no you know, real interest in these areas, particularly. I will cover them just like I did Niger uh, when that, that, the coup happened there and the situation was very tense, which, by the way, it seems to have cooled off. And it looks like the Nigerian government is going to be uh, the, you know, the coup government, the junta is going to be the uh, established government now. Um, the French forces are leaving the country. The uh, government has uh increased the price of exported uranium and has cut off uh, oil transport through the country, which is significant for France and Europe. Uh, once again, another production issue that will come into play later. Um, but back over to Israel and Palestine, I, I and, and I'm just going to lay out my opinions uh, because I don't really, uh, you know, I'm not a very religious person, so I don't have the religious connection that some Americans have with Israel. Um I see Israel as a, an issue in the Middle East, uh, but I also see uh, not the people of Palestine, but the organization uh, Hamas that is in uh, Palestine as a terror group. Uh, that's how I see them. Uh, the way I really see it is you have a, a terror group that is in Israel, the, the, the Zionists, uh, and you have a terror group in Hamas. Uh, one uses... AK-47s, IEDs, RPGs, drones. The other uses uh, JDAMs, uh, you know, F-35s, uh, gunships, uh, you know, all, all that good stuff. So they're just, I, I, I don't have the investment in this region. I don't have the, um, like I said, cultural connection. I don't, you know, I just don't have as much knowledge, but I'm going to cover the events and I'm going to try to leave my opinions out of it, except how I see it working out geostrategically. Um, so this morning I woke up at uh, four o'clock in the morning uh, to do Brian's show. Uh, Brian's in Thailand. So it was six o'clock at night for him. And when I woke up, I was surprised to see uh, IDF soldiers getting pulled out of a, uh, Israeli tank, uh, I forget how to pronounce it. It's um, it's not M Makivka, it's uh, Makarovka or something like that. Uh, four, it's a it's an Israeli tank uh, which had a RPG seven uh, thermobaric uh, warhead uh, from an RPG basically, uh, but a fancy one dropped from a drone, which is kind of interesting to see the Palestinians adopting the whole drone warfare. I mean, why wouldn't they? It's been incredibly successful, uh, and. You know, the, it destroyed the tank. Uh, the crew ha was violently ripped out of this tank and presented in a very, uh, I don't know. I've never, you know, you don't see a lot of this in the Ukraine conflict. Uh, even the bad stuff in the Ukraine conflict doesn't really come close. There's such bad blood in this region for so long uh, that they just, they just go in on each other. It's pretty brutal. It's like uh, Myanmar is the same way. Uh, it's just brutal to watch some of this stuff. Uh, but the, uh, after I saw that, I was like, oh, what's going on? This is a big deal. Right. Uh, and then I got into it and I was surprised to see that Hamas had basically done a massive operation in pretty deep into Israel, uh, Israel and had done a lot of damage. Uh, they went through cities, basically what I would consider conducting terror or operations on a large organized scale. They hit some military targets, which uh, was rather impressive and really underwhelming from the IDF. I don't know what they were doing. Uh, I, there are videos of these combat footages that you can find. I posted them on my Telegram and on my Twitter. So if you follow me there, but there are plenty of other people that also have posted them. Uh, and you can see that they, they're just, it, it feels like these Hamas guys are operating without 
any restrictions, you know, no suppressing fire on them, nothing. They run up to these bases uh, wildly unprotected and do a significant amount of damage and kill a lot of people on the inside, a lot of IDF soldiers. Uh, and they also went through and killed a large number of civilians. They took women, uh, particularly, uh, they took a lot of, uh, IDF prisoners. Uh, and I think the reason that they took so many was to prevent, uh, the Israeli government from being able to, uh, strike them uh, without fear of killing uh, their Israeli hostages uh, because that's what's coming. Uh, and it, it for the first like five or six hours of this operation, you know, the, the Palestinians were coming in on boats. They had naval operations. They had people coming in on uh, paragliders. Like it was, it's like a movie. Uh, these guys came in and they were just flying over and landed and got out and started doing what they were there to do, you know. Um, and at the end of it all, uh, a pretty significant area of Ukraine had at least been uh, put into some sort. I mean, sorry, not Ukraine. Israel had been put into some sort of gray zone by Hamas. The IDF looked like they got caught completely with their pants down. Uh, they did a significant amount of damage, took out a bunch of tanks, took out a bunch of armored vehicles all over the place. Uh, there were videos of F-16s being uh, transported on uh, truck beds away from air bases uh, just to protect them, uh, IDF uh, F-16s. And, uh, you know, it, it took a long time for the Israelis to sort of react to this. And I think a lot of people were very surprised because the uh, IDF is supposed to be this super trained, experienced uh, combat force that's always prepared to fight. Uh, but, you know, after this occurred, uh, we saw some a few JDAM strikes on some important buildings in uh, uh, the, on the Gaza Strip. And, uh, you know, once again, the response to terror to me, for me, is also terror from the Israelis. This is why I don't have a strong interest. I don't like either of these groups, particularly uh, in uh in Israel and in, in, in Palestine, um, because it just looked like kids probably getting killed in JDAM strikes. And it, it's just horrible. I just, it's like, it's like watching, uh, two Ukraines kind of go at it. And I don't mean that in that Ukraine is like a terror organization so much as, as in like, you know, when the, the Russians, when the Black Sea fleet got hit, when those that sub got destroyed, when, you know, when all that was going on, the Russians didn't react. They didn't get angry. They didn't, I mean, they might have gotten angry, but they didn't express that anger in any significant way uh, through any kinetic movement on the battlefield. They, you know, they just kind of went about their business and shrugged it off. And, and, you know, that's been the Russian approach. These guys seem to just go back and forth and just keep escalating, right? And this was a significant attack. I mean, this is a dark day for Israel in general. Um, the Israeli casualties, I think, are 250 civilians and uh, over 50 plus uh, uh, combat um, individuals with the IDF uh, and police forces. Um, so it was pretty significant lo uh, and, and losses. And, you know, they also had about 1,100 wounded. Th those are the numbers so far. We don't know. Uh, on top of that, we saw a large, large number of rocket attacks on uh, Tel Aviv um, from the Gaza Strip. They did, you know, insignificant, uncoordinated damage, but, you know, enough got through, sent a message, right? Probably killed some people, um, which is a big deal, but that... That it is what it is. Um, and then at the end of the day, uh, it, it, at the end of the day in Israel, it's still earlier in my day right now. Uh, but at the end of the day in Israel, um, we saw basically the entire government come together. Uh, everybody was unanimously in agreement that an operation in Gaza will occur. Uh, this is going to be called o Operation... Uh, Iron Swords, I think, uh, something like that. Operation Iron Swords is what I'm pretty sure it's called. They have always have goofy names for their operations, but um, this operation is going to be a land incursion into the Gaza Strip, uh, which I, I'm going to give my opinion on that in a second. 
uh, and it is going to involve basically raising most of Gaza. I do believe uh, I, they're talking about how it will never be the same. Uh, 50 years from now, they'll be looking back on it as some great victory. I think they're hoping that they're going to get something like the Azerbaijani outcome in uh, Nagaro Karkabakh. Uh, I can never say it because um, Azerbaijanis have the craziest words and Armenians have the craziest words. Um, but the operation will be significant. It will be violent. And I expect that it will be uh, bloody for both sides. But in the end, Israel Israel has the overwhelming force. Um, there are a couple of things that we need to think about when this operation is happening. Um, I think I think it's bait. There's There's two lines of logic that I'm following right now because I just don't know the area enough. How unprepared the Israeli Defense Force looked when these guys came in is suspicious to me, to say the least. I don't know why. I mean, you know you have an enemy right across the border. They have cameras everywhere. They have this constant back and forth. They're constantly looking out for terror attacks. They're stabbings regularly in Israel by Palestinians. You know, there's there's these all of these different things going on. And you let what the Israelis confirmed to be two to 300 Hamas uh, militants cross into Israel and basically run rampant through multiple towns uh, and take military bases and, uh, you know, all of this. It just seems off. I don't know if anybody agrees with that and comment below if you do, but it just seemed off. The reaction was not quick enough. It was, it was either pants around the ankles and stumbling, you know, in a ridiculous fashion, or they kind of let it happen because they wanted to end this situation in Gaza violently uh, on their terms. And this was the perfect Cassus Belli. They may have had intelligence that this was coming because Israel has operatives all throughout Gaza. I can't believe that they didn't know that this was coming. It seems ridiculous to me. Or if they did, maybe they did know and they just didn't expect the scale or the timing of it, I don't know, but that is slightly suspicious to me. So I still am entertaining ideas in that direction, but let's just take it at face value for what it's worth. Uh, the IDF looked incredibly unprepared. The Israeli or the Palestinians had great success with very minor uh, force commitment. And I say minor force commitment, they might have literally blown their whole load on this, uh, you know, adventure into Israel. I, I don't know the fighting capabilities of Hamas. I don't think anybody except the IDF has a very good idea. Um, and Hamas has a good idea. Um, but what it feels to me is that this was some sort of bait. Uh, they, the Palestinians, uh, I, Hamas in particular, uh, are baiting the Israelis to the south into Gaza, home turf for this bloody fight, basically a jihad, uh, uh, you know, it's going to end in the death of almost every Hamas militant that engages in combat with the, the IDF. And uh, it just seems, it just seems like bait. Uh, remember that Hamas, uh, not Hamas, um, Hezbollah to the north in Lebanon is right on the border of Israel. Uh, the Israelis are expecting an attack from Hezbollah as well. Hezbollah is also uh, backed by the uh, Iranian, uh, the IRGC, and they, you know, they're they're poised on that border all the time. Uh, and that you know, this is not something new that the Israelis have dealt with in 2006, uh, or they had to deal with in 2006, where they kind of got spanked uh, in Lebanon. But that's near neither here nor there. There, I, I believe that this intervention is exactly what Hamas and what what I what I assume Iran wanted. Uh, the Israelis and the Saudi Arabians were coming incredibly close to a peace deal. And I think this operation is going to basically destroy any hopes of that peace deal uh, coming to flourishing anytime soon. And that means that the West is losing out on uh, potentially Saudi Arabian oil uh, being loosened up uh, which is what the Biden administration needs. Uh, I think this is a very significant happening, and I think it's going to have impacts on Ukraine. 
we're already seeing the attention sort of shifting towards Israel uh, because that's a major issue in U.S. politics. Um, it's a very big deal. And that hurts Ukraine. Anything that takes attention away from Ukraine is going to hurt Ukraine. Uh, you, I would expect some ginormous show from Ukraine in the coming days and weeks to try to pull attention back. Uh, we'll see how long this operation in Gaza takes. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, just another issue that Ukraine and the West are going to be dealing with. I think that it serves Russia rather well. I don't think Russia is really behind it. I think that they're just kind of pleasantly okay with a distraction that is pulling U.S. attention. And, uh, you know, if the U.S. has to get involved in any way, uh, that'll be significant for the conflict in Ukraine. But uh, that's where I'm going to wrap it up today, guys. Thank you so much uh, for watching. Uh, remember to follow my Telegram, my Twitter. That's where you can find constant updates. You can also find me on Patreon. Uh, I will be doing an episode this week for my Patreon. I'm sorry, guys, that I haven't uploaded one. Uh, I've been I've been trying to figure out what I want to do with it. I'm, I'm considering turning it into sort of a question platform where I answer uh, Patreon questions every week. Um, but I don't know right now. Um, we're going to upload a video soon. Uh, it's been a little bit delayed. I've been extremely busy, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, but thank you for listening so much. This has been episode 71 of Calibre with Scott. I'm Scott. Have a good day.